Okay, how's everybody doing? Doing good. So um, let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. So we're talking, started talking about cerebral spinal fluid. We kind of left off there. So it's very similar to your blood plasma, right? The serum uh, piece of it. And um, so this is going to be bathing your brain and your spinal cord, provides nutrition, um, and it basically flows through the ventricles. Um, from the laterals to the third via the interventricular foramina. We talked a little bit about that before. From the third, it goes to the fourth via the cerebral aqueduct. And then there's some apertures in that particular area that will allow it to basically drain back into the subarachnoid space, um, to the arachnoid granulations, and then to the dura sinus, which basically sends it back to the venous blood system. Um, and so that's just basically, basically the path. We'll kind of see a little bit of a picture of this here in just a second. Now, where it all comes from is basically what's called the choroid plexus. And so the uh, choroid plexus is an area in the lateral ventricles. It's made of ependymal cells. Remember, these are type of glial cells. And so these kind of uh, form little invaginations into the actual uh, ventricle itself it's in each uh, each ventricle and what happens basically is this is the structure that will essentially sort of create the cerebral spinal fluid in the individual um, ventricles and then as it sort of creates this fluid remember all of your body fluids are basically descendants of your blood plasma that's kind of where your fluids come from and so what we do is the different body fluids we have we alter them essentially to sort of take on different looks. And so the cerebral spinal fluid um, oftentimes in these ventricles will be the primary fluid that we'll use for the transport of fluids, waters, solutes that may be needed by the central nervous system, um, sodium concentrations, things of that nature. And so what happens is these ependymal cells in the choroid plexus will be transporting sodium, the ion itself, It'll be dumping that into the ventricles um, and that allows the water to chase it. That's kind of how you get the fluid into the ventricles itself. It's basically a classic osmotic trick. That's how your body gets water to move around. And so um, you'll have different uh, types of molecules in there. Large ones will be moving by exocytosis. Um, glucose will have its own special transporters to basically put that into the cerebral spinal fluid. Remember, glucose is the nutrition for the, the brain itself. And so when you take a look at your ventricles, you'll see that these little ruffly areas here, um, these little red ruffly areas, that's where the choroid plexus is. And some of you guys saw like the little blue things in the uh, brain models. That's, we're trying to highlight the choroid plexus in there. And so these little, if you blow it up, you can see the choroid plexus is basically um, a series of ependymal cells which are epithelial cells that are lining, um, in this case, a vascular capillary. And so from there, it basically will move fluids through these epithelial cells and then push that fluid into the actual ventricular space, along with any nutrients and things of that uh, nature. And so that's basically where we start. And then from there, it's going to move from the laterals through this interventricular foramina into the third ventricle. And then from the third ventricle, it'll go through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth. And then from the fourth, it will basically move around through these lateral apertures and median apertures. So these basically um, are going to allow that cerebral spinal fluid to kind of circulate around the spinal cord and then kind of go back up into this subarachnoid space. So this little yellow piece right here is basically the arachnoid space. And it basically floats through that arachnoid space until it reaches one of these, uh, what's called arachnoid granulations. So if you see 
the arachnoid granulation, the blow up of it. This is the arachnoid space where the cerebral spinal fluid is flowing through. And then this little granulation kind of basically pushes itself up, kind of um, evaginates itself up um, in the middle of this sinus, this dural sinus. So this is like a venous blood flow here. And then what it does is it basically just allows any of that waste product to get picked up by the venous blood system and to take it off to the cardiovascular system. And so these little granulations you can see are kind of intruding into that venous blood structure um, that circulates through this, um, this dural sinus. Um, and so that kind of is how you take this uh, material away from the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. So your blood supply, um, basically you have um, a lot of vasculature. So ultimately of the complete complement that's pumped by your heart, you're getting almost not quite about a quarter of the total volume of the blood that's pumped by the heart. Um, and so if you cut this off, then you can pass out, right? So that's basically um, a bad thing. If you cut off the oxygen to your brain, obviously you can create brain damage, right? That's one of the reasons why uh, brain injuries that, have, that, um, that uh, kind of intrude on blood delivery to the, to the brain can be, can be quite bad. And so oftentimes this is the blood that's basically coming into the brain. It's delivering oxygen to the brain, brain that you need and also glucose because the brain primarily burns glucose for its energy. Now then, the, um, the blood will come through the internal carotids, so your carotid arteries, and you'll learn about this more in the vascular chapter in MP2, and the vertebral arteries will basically bring blood to the brain, and then it'll basically move through what's called the basilar artery, um, and then the circle of Willis, or the arterial circle, which kind of encircles the brain and sort of distributes it, kind of like a traffic circle throughout the brain itself. And so if you take a look at... Okay, I omitted that slide. <laughs> so if you kind of take a look at it, you basically just kind of have this sort of traffic circle, which is the circle of Willis, and you have all these arteries shooting off from the brain, basically delivering blood to the different areas of the brain. So the blood-brain barrier then is essentially associated with the astrocytes. We talked about this a little bit before, right, where they have these foot processes that will essentially screen the blood coming into the neurons. And then ultimately, these will... Um, determine which types of nutrients come into the brain. That's the blood-brain barrier. It has to cross through the astrocytes. And we talked a little bit about that already in chapter 11. So I don't want to kind of go back over that too much, but necessarily that this is essentially required um, for the brain to be able to get the nutrients it needs. It passes typically by diffusion. Some of the things that are lipid soluble, like nicotine, for instance, ethanol and heroin uh, drugs can immediately enter into the brain, which is Part of the reason why they're so effective is because they don't need a whole lot of extra help in there. They can go straight into the neurons and uh, create an effect. So for instance, if you take some of these, then the effect will essentially be quick uh, in terms of your ability to feel those effects. Water soluble things um, oftentimes have to be helped. So you have to transport those with different types of facilitated transport in order to get those things in, but they are important. So glucose, for instance, amino acids, they need to get into the brain because the brain needs those materials in order for the energy to be able to do what it does. And it also needs to be able to utilize amino acids to build the proteins that it needs to build. And so they need nutrients as well. The difference is most cells get the nutrients themselves directly from the capillaries, whereas the brain has to get this screened through the astrocytes. Right? So it doesn't have the capacity to get the blood directly itself. It has to get it through the astrocytes, and that's the blood-brain barrier. Okay, cranial nerves. So the cranial nerves basically represents uh, pretty much the most of the rest of the chapter. So basically what I'm gonna do is I wanna start going through these. They're so called because basically they are go going from the brain and for the most part, they're mostly associated with the senses, the five senses, and we typically will number them one through 12, there's 12 of them. And they typically will have Roman numerals associated with them. Um, some of them are sensory in nature. Some of them are somatic in nature. Some are parasympathetic in nature, so they have slightly different types of roles, but generally speaking, these are your cranial nerves. So you can see um, you have cranial nerve number one, that's your olfactory bulb. So that's basically gonna be associated with your sense of smell. And so what I wanna do is basically kind of break these back. I'm gonna keep coming back to these brain pictures so that we can kind of bounce back and forth. Um, and so 
this basically is a good outlay. This will help you as well for your model studies um, in terms of understanding where the different uh, cranial nerves are as they're mapped out on the brain itself. Now, some of our models, we actually have them numbered uh, by the Roman numerals. And this particular one, it kind of shows you where it's kind of mapped out. And this is an actual human brain where you can see uh, the cranial nerves is like white fibrous types of nerves uh, as they're represented on the actual brain itself. This is a pretty good quality brain, um, that particular one. So of our designations, of the 12, three of them are sensory, that's olfactory, optic, and vestibular cochlear. Um, five of them are somatic motor. That means they're involved in musculature. And so that's trochlear, abusins, accessory, hyperglossal, um, and... Uh, <laughs> hypoglossal twice um, and 13. Huh? Okay. Hypoglossal is there's a 13th cranial nerve apparently. Um, that's news to me, but okay, <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, so there's 12, right? So basically um, number 12 is hypoglossal. So somatic and sensory, that means I have both dual roles, tri, tri gem. Um, if you're somatic and parasympathetic, you're the ocular motor. If you have somatic motor, sensory, and parasympathetic, all three, that's true for three of them, glossopharyngeal, facial, and vagus. Okay, so you can break them up by whether or not they're just taking in information or they're sending out information or they're part of the parasympathetic group or all three. Okay. So this is just a way to sort of help you construct and organize the cranial nerve. So let's go ahead and start off with the first one. So the olfactory uh, nerve is cranial nerve number one. And so it's sensory, so this is your sense of smell. So you can see it highlighted. Um, and so basically what happens is your olfactory bulb is gonna be resting right on top of the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. And these little olfactory nerves are gonna dangle down into the upper portion of your nasal cavity, allowing you to be able to take in uh, molecules for the sense of smell. So that's all fact, that's number one. Number two is the optic nerve. And you guys have seen this already because you've seen the optic um, chiasm. And so that little crisscross that it does right before, right in front of the pituitary, but each of the nerves themselves will actually go, go up to the backside of the eyeball. And it's gonna be taking in um, sensory information for the purpose of vision control. Um, and it'll be delivering it through that optic chiasm, through the visual cortex, which is in the occipital lobe of your brain. Number three is oculomotor. So this basically has both uh, elements of motor control and also parasympathetic role as well. And so the oculomotor, basically what it's gonna be doing is controlling um, eye muscles. So the motor movements of eye muscles, um, motor-wise. So you can see the oculomotor which is basically innervating the superior rectus muscle. It's innervating um, the, uh, the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. So that's basically um, um, right behind the superior rectus. So the superior rectus is designed to kind of move the eyeball up. And then it's also innervating the oblique muscle. So the inferior oblique, which kind of allows your eyeball to roll, um, to, roll to the uh, lateral side. And of course it is um, attaching to the um, inferior rectus muscle as well. So you can see it's attaching to a lot of the different eyeball muscles, allowing it to be able to move up and down or roll side to side. So that's a little bleak. So ocular motor you'll see coming off right um, by the, uh, the pawns. <clears throat> And so the other thing I like about this particular group of images is it also shows you um, where it exits, right? So for instance, in uh, the optic nerve, um, it's moving through the optic foramen, which is one of those holes in the skull that you guys saw in the eye orbit. The superior orbital fissure is that big slot-like structure that you guys saw in the eye of the orbit when you guys were looking at the skulls. And so your ocular motor is going through that particular slot. Number four is the trochlear. This is also going through the superior orbital fissure. And the trochlear is also gonna be a motor, but it's gonna be associated with the superior oblique for the most part. It's gonna be taking a look at the superior oblique, which will essentially roll your eye uh, medially. And so 
um, that is going to be, if you can see, it's coming coming right off of the ponds, um, right in this position here. So ocular motors are right here, and then the trochlears are right here. So now all of a sudden, we're four deep into our list of 12, and already three of them have to do with the eye. Right, optic, ocular motor, and trochlear. The trigem is an important one. The trigem basically is uh, the face. It's, uh, it's nerve number five. And so it will go through a couple of different um, foramen or fissures. It'll go through the superior orbital fissure. This will also move through the foramen rotundum. Remember that one? So we, we remember, we memorize those um, different uh, structures and also a branch of it will go through the foramen ovale. So now all of a sudden, all of those holes in your skull that we learned about in the first half of the semester are now making sense because you've got some major cranial nerves that are going through those holes. The trigem, unlike some of the others, is actually broken up into multiple branches. So you have three different major branches. You have the ophthalmic branch, uh, which is V1 or um, 5 one the maxillary branch, and then you have the mandibular branch. So the ophthalmic branch basically is going to be innervating the forehead, the nose, upper eyelid, and regions of the scalp. The maxillary is going to be forming the upper palate and the upper jaw and the upper teeth. As a matter of fact, whenever the dentist goes to um, numb your teeth because they need to do a filling in your upper teeth, what they're going for is the maxillary branch of the trigem. That's one of the reasons why when you get that upper region numbed, it kind of numbs like your cheek and the upper portions of your face because part of that nerve branch is actually going to the cheek and the lower eyelid and the upper lip. So you can actually see what branches of the trigeminal are being, where the, well, how far they extend by getting yourself numbed up at the dentist's office. So next time you have to go and get yourself numbed up, just make a note of where all the numbness is and you'll be able to map where that particular branch is going. It's, that's a perfect nerve thing to do. But, I mean, it's better than just fussing and fuming about the fact that you're still numb, right? Now the mandibular branch is gonna have both sensory and motor. So the sensory, this is gonna be going lower jaw and lower teeth. So this is basically when the dentist is going for a bottom uh, tooth. Um, and so they're gonna be numbing that particular area up. And so they're going for that mandibular branch of the trigem. So it's gonna go after your lower lip, right? Your lower lip feels like it's full of sand and the cheek and the chin. And so that's the reason why your chin feels all numb. You can actually feel the, the extent of that mandibular branch of the trigem. And then of course the motor um, is controlling the you know, masseter, which is uh, the temporalis and the medial. Now, Generally speaking, when you get numbed up, you don't really um, affect your motor components. But you can see here the overall map of the three branches. So this is V1, V2, and V3, as they basically outline on the face itself. And then from the brain, you can actually see where the trigem comes out on either side of the pons. And you can, if a, a good prep, you can actually see the three different branches coming out of the trigem. So one of the ways I remember the trigem is number five is I basically just take my hand, put it on my face, and I say, that's five, trigem, great, it's deep face. And so number six is going to be the abducens. Again, this is going through the superior orbital fissure. Notice how everything's going through the superior orbital fissure because it's an enormous hole in your eye orbit. So you imagine there's probably a lot of stuff going through there. This is a motor one. Again, it's eye musculature. In this case, you're going after the lateral rectus. All right, this is the one that basically allows you to move your eye um, to the side. Not roll it, but just directly move it laterally. This one you'll see coming off of the brainstem. Um, and so this is also eye movement. So you notice there's a lot of cranial nerves so far that are dedicated to the eye itself. So number seven is facial. Now, a lot of times people will be like, well, wait a minute, didn't we just talk about the face and trigem? We did. But the facial is a little bit different in the sense that unlike the trigem, which has mostly sensory and a little bit of motor, the facial has um, all three, sensory motor and parasympathetic. So typically when you take a look at the facial, a lot of what it's innervating is your sense of taste. That is from the anterior portion of your tongue. So these, the front part of your tongue is going to be driven by your facial nerve. Um, also, a little bit of your external ear and palate is going to be controlled by your facial as well. Now, in terms of motor, 
What it controls are basically the muscles of facial expression. So all those superficial muscles that we saw on the face, except for the masseter, right? That one's uh, governed by trigem. But um, the, the facial muscles, the ones for your smiling and frowning and all those sorts of muscles, those are all driven by the facial. So that's the reason why I say trigem is deep face and facial is superficial. It's your expression, right? So the facial nerve is controlling your expressions. Now, parasympathetic wise, it's in control of also your sublingual salivary glands and your lacrimal glands, which are typically glands associated with your digestive system. And of course, with your respiratory system or your incoming system with your lacrimal glands, um, respectively. And so this is kind of like what it looks like. You can see your facial nerve basically will come in and break into all these. Um, so here's your trigem that breaks into these different branches and your facial is basically innervating all these more superficial muscles that are associated with your facial expression. Number eight out of 12. Number eight is vestibular cochlear. So vestibular cochlear is uh, gonna be moving through the internal auditory canal, that internal acoustic meatus that we saw in the temporal bone. And so this is gonna be sensory, but it's gonna divide into two branches. It's gonna become the cochlear nerve and the vestibular nerve. So the vestibular cochlear nerve comes out um, of the brainstem as a single nerve. So you can see that here. And then what's gonna happen is it's gonna divide into the cochlear and to the vestibular nerve. So the cochlear nerve will then basically wrap itself around your inner ear and take in information for hearing. The vestibular nerve will interact with the semicircular canals, which will give you your sense of balance and equilibrium. And so that's your vestibular um, nerve. So your sense of balance and equilibrium is your vestibular nerve. Your sense of hearing is your cochlear nerve. Number nine is the glossopharyngeal, right? Glosso means tongue, pharyngeal means throat. So this is tongue throat. Again, like um, facial, this has all three. So it has sensory, motor, and parasympathetic. In terms of the sensory, this is going to be going after your taste, but now it's the taste in that the rest of your tongue, that posterior one third, right? Remember, facial is in charge of the front two thirds and now glossopharyngeal is in charge of the posterior third that's left over. Um, it's also collecting information from your tonsils um, and your middle ear, your carotid sinuses as well. In terms of motor capacity, what's gonna be happening here is uh, this is going to be um, your pharyngeal muscles in your throat. Um, it'll be proprioceptive. That's basically positional awareness. Um, and so it's associated with that kind of uh, motor um, control of your of the back of your throat. And the parasympathetic is um, tied into the control of the salivary glands, which is part of your digestive system, right? And your di that part is, is automatic. And so you can see how the glossopharyngeals are coming off right next to um, the facials. And so you can see now the glossopharyngeals will come down and it'll innervate the back half of the tongue and the back muscles of the throat itself. Now, the mighty number 10, if there was a leader amongst the 12, it would be vagus. Vagus is important. It goes through the jugular foramen, right? And so it has also all three capacities, sensory, motor, and parasympathetic. For sensory, basically what's happening is it's collecting information from the abdominal organs, from the larynx, from the thoracic organs, um, and pretty much anything that's below the throat. In terms of motor, it's controlling a lot of the, um, the throat, the larynx, it's being controlled by the larynx, voice production, and also the backside of the tongue. Um, and so, and it also is in control of what's called proprioception, which is kind of like a sense of muscular awareness, like the muscles kind of know where they are in space, in three-dimensional space. And then a parasympathetic is probably the most important thing for the vagus nerve, because these are the, this is the nerve that's in control of the entire parasympathetic division of your autonomic nervous system. And it's also in control of managing and regulating all the abdominal organs and the visceral organs of your core visceral systems. So when you take a look at it, 
you'll see that basically it innervates just about every major core system that you're going to be learning about in AMP2. Number 11, the accessory. This one's um, going through the foramen magnum and the jugular foramen. It's a motor. And so it largely will uh, be working with the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. So you'll actually see the accessory nerve innervating with the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. And so ultimately this will help you to rotate your neck. Um, if you have nerve damage here, you're gonna have issues with uh, moving and rotating your neck itself. So the accessory nerve is typically um, easy one to spot because it has this sort of like comb-like uh, structure uh, that's down close to the uh, bottom side of the brainstem. And the final one, hypoglossal, is um, going to be what it says, hypo below glossal the tongue. This is a motor one. And so this is basically looking at um, tongue muscle uh, movement. It's looking at the... Um, the different types of glossal uh, divisions, right? The stylo, hyoglossal, genioglossal, and the back throat muscles, uh, uh, the thyrohyoid and the geniohyoid. So a lot of these throat muscles that you tend not to think about are innervated by the hypoglossal. So the under portion of the muscles, not the tongue itself, but the muscles just below the tongue that typically are attached to this hyoid bone either um, superior or inferior to the highway bone itself. Okay, so notice you have a lot of cranial nerve capacity um, in your body. Now, some of the reflexes, and we'll talk more about the reflexes in the next chapter. Um, ultimately, when you take a look at, say, for instance, uh, cardiovascular reset reflexes, essentially like heart, blood pressure, respiratory reflexes, and things like that, generally speaking, they are involving the vagus nerve. The two biggies in the core visceral and the ones that you actually talk about the most throughout AMP2 in terms of nervous regulation of all the core systems is the vagus nerve, number one. And number two, the big one is the glossopharyngeal. So number nine and number 10 oftentimes go along together like Batman and Robin, okay? And so they'll, you oftentimes see those repeated over and over and over again as you start talking about nervous regulation of the core, the core systems in AMP2. So a couple of other cranial nerve reflexes that you see, um, for instance, when your eyes turn toward a sudden noise, um, or if you have a flash of light, or if you're tracking a moving object. So these are reflexes involving cranial nerves. We'll talk more about reflexes and the reflex arc. Right, because remember I said that in chapter 13, they're, they assume we've already been done chapter 12. And so they kind of assume that. So they're assuming that you understand the reflex arc. So just hold on to this because we're almost immediately getting ready to jump into chapter 12. We're going to be talking a lot about reflex arcs and different types of reflexes. Um, and so this will kind of make a little bit more sense. But um, these typically tend to be visceral reflexes. And most reflexes are, for the most part, um, uh, subconscious, right? So you don't really think about a reflex is something that just happens. And a lot of times um, these different reflexes that you have, for instance, um, just a reflex to close off your middle ear to protect those inner ear ossicles um, is a reflex of, um, of multiple cranial nerves. And so um, you'll have uh, different types of reflexes. Now, then some of the disorders uh, that we have of these cranial nerves. Um, I don't wanna go through all of these, um, but ultimately um, you have different types of um, CNS disorders versus cranial nerve disorders. For instance, I mean, a cerebral aneurysm where essentially an entire area of your brain is devoid of oxygen because of a burst um, artery or something like that, or a stroke, similar idea. Um, so basically a stroke is a deprivation of blood flow to the brain. A concussion is basically when your brain actually takes um, a blow, when it can create a lot of problems. It can actually rupture blood vessels in there. You can create hematomas, brain swelling. And if you put brain swelling in there because it's enclosed by your cranial cavity, by your cranial bone, then if the brain starts to swell, it can create a lot of pressure. And that pressure can ultimately lead to 
really bad things, which is what happens with concussions and things like that. And so that's one of the reasons to um, to uh, then that can actually, if it's if it's allowed to uh, to get out of control, it can actually send you into a coma. Um, so like initially, you could take a really huge blow. You could be like walking around like for the most part ambulatory, but as your brain starts to swell, you can start creating pressure on the brain, and that can send you into a coma. And so later on, you can just you know go into a coma and not come out of it. It's one of the reasons why a lot of times when you get a blow to the head or you're, con you're concussed, and the last thing you want to do is go to sleep because what can happen is you cannot wake up again. Um, and so the idea is stay awake. And if it's really bad, then oftentimes what will happen is the doctors will actually cut a hole in your skull to help alleviate some of the pressure um, so that it doesn't start to create too much uh, of a problem. So some cranial nerve disorders. Um, so trigeminal neuralgia, this is basically a sharp pain in the trigeminal nerve. Um, oftentimes it just sort of um, just happens. We're not quite sure. So any kind of an algae is like a fibromyalgia is like a muscle pain, a nondescript muscle pain. The neuralgia is kind of a nondescript neural pain. So some of these don't really have necessarily explanations to them. Um, but migraine obviously is secure as a severe headache. Um, this is, and again, we're not quite sure what brings them on, uh, but they are oftentimes very different than a traditional headache, right? Because a lot of times people will describe migraines as not the way you describe a traditional headache, which is associated with pain, but oftentimes they'll describe uh, migraines as not being very painful, but they'll be doing weird things. Like they'll get tunnel vision or their senses will just kind of whack out and then, um, and then the pain will come later. Right, so um, it does a lot of different, um, a lot of different things uh, in different people, and they're, they, yeah, Sierra's right. They can be quite debilitating, right? So oftentimes when people say, "I've got a migraine, I can't come in today," I'm like, Psh, "Take your liberty, do what you need to do," because I totally understand, right? I mean, migraines can be very, very difficult to deal with. Facial palsy, which is paralysis of your face, that would be going after probably more likely the uh, facial nerve more than likely, um, and uh, herpes simplex type two. Um, this is basically can go after the trigeminal ganglia and cause different types of deep face innervation problems. Okay. okay. <clears throat> that is the end of 13.